New Westminster War Veterans Oral History Project. Today's date is December 17, 2001. The interviewee is Mr. Kent Lovick, who is in the Navy. Mr. Lovick, can you tell me what your full name is? My full name is Arthur Kent Lovick. And what is your date and place of birth? Place of birth, Victoria, B.C., November the 8th, 1914. And what is your marital status? I'm married with two children. With two children. And what's your wife's name and maiden name? Uh, Marion Ross McLean. Okay, and your children's names? Nancy, now married to Brian Walplington. Mm -hmm. Son's name is Martin. Okay. And when were they born? Nancy was born in 1947, uh, Martin in 1948. Okay. Uh, where were your parents from? Both my parents were from England. Mm, okay. And did they move straight to Victoria then, and that's where you were born, or is that how it worked? They moved initially to Vancouver, and then to Victoria. Okay. Um, could you tell me your current address? We live at number 501. 71 Jameson Court in New Westminster. And what about current, or sorry, previous places of residences after the war? In uh, 1947, we built a house at 319 Churchill Avenue in New Westminster and lived there for 45 years. And then you came here. Exactly. Right. Okay. So, um, Mr. Lovick, what branch of the armed forces were you enrolled in? I was in the Navy. And what was your rank and <clears throat> position? Uh, I was discharged as a petty officer writer. Okay. And so what would have been the progress of ranks then? Uh, initially writer, then leading writer, and then petty officer. Okay, I see. And what was your duty as a petty officer? Uh, mainly uh, in the um, pay office. Uh, we calculated and paid the ship's companies. So you... So you resided on the ship then, is that right? Sometimes, sometimes <laughs> at, at the, in the bases. Oh, I see, okay. So tell me, when did you enroll in the Navy? In the spring of 42. And was that in Victoria or? No, it was in Vancouver. It was in Vancouver. And how did your family feel? Well, everybody was uh, joining up at the time, so it was expected, I think. Was it? Yeah. Yeah. And how old would you have been then? 28. 28. Oh, so you're an older guy than yeah. most as well, right. hey? When you enrolled, did you enroll just on your own or with friends? No, just on my own. Yeah. And why? Really? Why the Navy? Or why yeah, the why, why the Navy and, and why... Why enroll in general? Well, my first, um, well, I realized that uh, if I didn't enroll, somewhere along the line I was going to be drafted. Right. And, or conscripted, whatever you want to right. call it. And uh, my first uh, choice would have been uh, air crew. Mm -hmm. But I knew my eyes weren't good enough for that. I'd never passed the physical. So uh, the Navy was my second choice, and uh, I think maybe a good one, too. Right, right. Um, so how many years of service did you complete? Four years. And so when were you discharged then? 1946, okay. the end of February. 
end of February. So early 46th then. Good. And that would have been back here? Yep. In Vancouver or? Yes. Okay. So when you heard that Canada declared war on Germany, so what, what sort of things were going through your mind? What sort of feelings did you have? Well, I guess uh, I knew eventually that uh, I was going to be have to take part mm -hmm. uh, somehow right. uh, because I was single, and uh, and I was quite willing to quite willing to go to. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And as I say, everybody, all my friends were starting to join up and right, so right. forth. So <laughs> right, and and did you feel? Angry at Germany or anything, or was this? I think I think I did. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where did you get your training? Initially, basic training in Vancouver okay. at HMCS Discovery, which okay. is in Stanley Park. Right. Right. And then to uh, Esquimalt mm -hmm. for technical training, and from there they. Uh, Sent me to Halifax. So straight to Halifax after yes. that. And what sort of training did you get? In the, uh, the way the Navy kept their accounts. Oh, okay. And how they paid people and so okay. forth. Yeah. So, so were you an accountant before you went into the yes, Navy? Yes, I was. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that worked out well then. Yeah. What was, what was training camp like? What was the environment like? Well, it was it was different to, to what I had. Uh, the basic training, of course, was uh, marching, mm -hmm. how to handle a rifle, mm -hmm. um, various um, things that taught you what the, how the Navy worked mm -hmm. and nautical terms and so forth. Oh, really, eh? So mm -hmm. it's quite different then from yeah. the others. Well, everybody, that, uh, no matter what branch of the Navy you were in, took this basic training. Okay. Everybody took the same thing. Right. And then in your advanced training, that would have been classroom-style stuff? That's or? right. Oh, I see, I see. Take me through an average day of, of training then. Let's see. Well, we're going back quite a few years. <laughs> Um, it consist well. It consisted a lot of uh, uh, marching uh -huh. and uh, physical uh, training too. What would they? Would you have woken up early at a certain time and then off you went to breakfast? Or well, initially for basic training, I was still living at home. Oh, okay, and I went every day. And then uh, when they sent me to Esquimalt, of course, then I was in barracks. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then the training in Halifax as well. Yeah. Tell me about your journey across the Atlantic. Well, uh, in um, the fall of 1943, uh, Canada was going to get two cruisers from the Royal Navy, and they, they had a draft of about 700 men, and we marched from the barracks down to the docks in Halifax and boarded the uh, Mauritania okay. and uh, went overseas to uh, Liverpool, mm -hmm. and then up to the... Um, Canadian naval base in Scotland. Okay, and that's where you're stationed then. Yes, that's where I was stationed. Right, right. For about ten months, I guess. Ten months. Yeah. And and so you were on land then. For yes. About ten months. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Um, what was it like in England? What was it like in Scotland? Well, Scotland was quite nice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there were no bombs dropping around there. Not, right. Not when I was there, anyway. And uh, it was it was fairly pleasant. Yeah, it was a new experience right, yeah. for all of us. What were the people like? The well, civilians. The pe people were nice. Yeah, very nice. 
Did, did you have a chance to interact with the spots? Quite often, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, what about social life? What sort of things would you have done while you were in the UK? Well, they had, uh, they had uh, very nice hostels in uh, Glasgow, which mm -hmm. was the closest big city to where we were. Mm -hmm. uh, we were in uh, Greenock okay. at the uh, mouth of the Clyde. Okay. And we got Glasgow was about 45 minutes away by train. And we'd go up for a weekend and stay at a hospital. hospital. Mm -hmm. They had parties mm -hmm. for all the, the uh, services. Mm -hmm. And it was very nice. They, they, they did a good job for us. Right. Did you ever go on extended leave while you were in the UK? Not or, really. No. 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 Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, well, why don't you... I mean, since you're in the Navy mm -hmm. and you spent much of your time on a ship... Can you sort of uh, just briefly go through the different areas you would have visited and the different ships you would have been on? Okay. Let's see. In, in the uh, fall of 1943, I was seconded to the Royal Navy, and they sent me to Scapa Flow, which was the... Uh, home base of the uh, Royal Navy. Okay. And I joined the uh, cruiser HMS Berwick. That's B-E-R-W-I-C-K. Okay. <laughs> yeah, she was a county class cruiser. And uh, my first ship, my first big ship that I'd been on, and uh, a couple of days after joining, we put to sea, and uh, I realized that we were then in a convoy going to Murmansk in Russia. So, uh, and then that's Siberia, is that right? Or yeah. Right. Middle of nowhere. Really. Middle of nowhere. That's <laughs> right. That's right. So. Uh, that took us, I don't know, about two weeks, I guess, to uh, to get there. Uh, we were senior escort in the convoy, which consisted of uh, several fast merchant ships, uh, one small aircraft carrier, and the um, former Empress of Japan, and uh, the Empress of Japan carried about 5,000 Russians. The Russians had uh, initially been captured by the Germans in Europe, recaptured by the Allies, and sent over to England, where they worked on farms. And uh, this then was their repatriation back to Russia. Right, right. To Siberia, of all places. Yeah. They couldn't have been pleased. No, I'm sure they weren't. <laughs> the last we saw of them, they were being marched down through Murmansk with armed guards on both sides of the columns. So so these were soldiers, and, and right. they were being marched had, through what? Yeah. Had been, and so they weren't soldiers any longer. Well, I, I would imagine they're going to all be debriefed as to what they learned or what they'd done, right? And maybe in some cases uh, uh, punished for probably surrendering or whatever. Right, 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 right. So um, after that, did you stay with the Royal Navy then? After that, we came back from uh, Murmansk, and we went in to, uh, to have some repairs done at Ross Scythe. And while we were there, uh, we got a, a rush call from Admiralty, I guess. The next thing I knew, we were on our way to Malta. <laughs> 
and uh, just as a single ship. Oh, okay. And uh, we went to Gibraltar and then Malta, and we came back and picked up some uh, British troops from uh, North Africa and brought them back to Scotland just in time to get them home for Christmas. Oh, I see. Okay. So I went back to Scapa Flow, and the following day I came back to the uh, base, Canadian base, in Scotland, and they were going to send me home for leave. Oh, I see. Which was fine with me. <laughs> Back to Canada. Back to Canada. Nice. Which they did. And I came back on the uh, Queen Mary to New York, mm -hmm. and then up to Montreal and back, of course, by train, because there were no aircraft flying <laughs> in those days. Right. Right. So then, um, when we got back here, we were married. Marion and I were married. Is that, is that what you did on leave? As you got married? Yep. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. And uh, went back to Halifax again and stayed there, I guess, for about uh, two weeks or three weeks. And then uh, boarded the uh, French ship called the Louis Pasteur and went back to uh, Scotland again, Liverpool and to Scotland. Okay. And uh, following that, I was sent to uh, Belfast to join the uh, HMCS Ontario, which was hadn't been commissioned at that time. It mm -hmm. was still being finished at the Harlan and Wolfe shipyards. Mm -hmm. So then uh, we sailed from uh, Belfast in May of 45, and um, went up to Scapa Flow for a short time uh, for uh, drills of various kinds, gunnery practice and so forth, and then headed south to the uh, Mediterranean on Malta. Okay. Again, <laughs> for me anyway. Yes. Yeah. And from there, we went through the Suez Canal, and I believe we were heading for Australia at the time, but then the Japanese were figuring they were going to surrender, so we were routed through the Indian Ocean to uh, then Ceylon, now Sri Lanka. Okay. And uh, we... Uh, stayed at the, at the naval base of Trincomalee, which is on the eastern coast of Ceylon. And after a short time there, we were detailed to escort two British troop ships to Hong Kong, which we did through uh, coming down the Burma coast and through the Straits of Malacca into the South China Sea and up to Hong Kong mm. where we dropped the two ships off. Right. And we were there at the time for the formal surrender of the Japanese in Hong Kong. Did you guys celebrate? Yes, I think they spliced the main brace. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a shot of rum. Good, good. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we were there for about uh, a month, I guess. And we had patrols ashore, and uh, some of our, about a third of our crew was ashore at the time in various uh, camps that the Japanese had kept their prisoners of war. And uh, Following that, we headed home via the uh, Philippines, and Guam, 
and Pearl Harbor, and then back to Esquimalt. All right, so you did around the world. Did around the world above the equator. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, well that's great. Um, let, let's get into maybe the environment on the ship. What, mm -hmm. what was it like living on a ship? The, the Ontario. <coughs> well, it was crowded. Was it? Yeah. Uh, we had a, a crew of 900 officers and men. So uh, it was difficult sometimes to find space to, to breathe and, <laughs> and turn around. But uh, it's something you got used to. Right. It, uh, the, in, in, um, Food was good, and good good cooks, mm -hmm. uh, contrary to what I had in the Royal Navy, which was pretty grim. Was it? <laughs> well, I, uh, when I first went to the Royal Navy, we, I, uh, I was what they call temperance, that is, I didn't, I didn't take my rum issue. Oh, okay. There was a rum issue each day. And uh, if you didn't take it, you got six cents a day instead of the rum. Oh, okay. <laughs> but uh, but uh, I soon switched to grog when I was in the Royal Navy because it was the only thing I, that I could get the food down with. <laughs> Seriously? I thought of rum, rum first, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I guess that's why they had it. That's <laughs> It helped. <laughs> But yeah, but uh, the Ontario, you yeah, know, it was fine. It was fine. There was a good bunch of guys on it, and, and, uh, and it was relatively pleasant for a, a, a wartime right. ship. Right. Yeah. And, and what sort of what was your uniform like? Uh, well, by then I was a petty officer, and I had the uh, brass buttons and the. Uh, and the uh, insignia on the sleeves, mm -hmm. and Canada flashes, of course, on the shoulder. Mm -hmm. So, uh, just a regular uh, naval uniform. So it was white, is that right? Just for the tropics it was white. Oh, okay. Otherwise it was navy blue. It was navy blue. Yeah. Okay, and so did you, so you had two uniforms, is yeah. that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, and in hot weather, I've seen photos of you guys in just shorts. In shorts. <laughs> no tops. No tops. <laughs> yeah. And so this would have been regular on the ship? Yeah, then? not a problem. Yeah. Not a problem. Yeah. But not when you're ashore, is that right? No, no. No, you have to be properly dressed to go ashore. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. What about things like mail service? Well, it, it arrived if you were lucky, and depending on where you were, it, uh, it, Eventually arrived, right? And uh, of course, I was smoking in those days, so we'd get cigarettes in the mail too. You see, to look for which those. we sometimes used for barter. <laughs> we were trying to find something ashore that we liked. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. Um, and then you, you you talked a little bit about what the environment on the ship was like and eating arrangements, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so when you did this trip around the world, you must have stopped in many different ports and harbors. Any we did experiences? Quite a few. Or, um, I can't uh, think of anything off that. Well, there must have been. Uh, this wasn't in a port, but... Uh, when we were entering the uh, Malacca Straits, uh, escorting uh, these two troop ships, uh, it was known that the Japanese had gun emplacements along the shore of the strait. Mm. So uh, just in case they hadn't got the word that they were supposed to surrender, uh, we decided to... Uh, exercise the uh, guns, the close-range weapons. My battle station was the number two man on a twin Orlikon. Uh, so 
the four inch guns would throw up uh, parachute targets and the guns would fire and follow the parachute target down to the water. Okay. And uh, just aft of our position, there was what we called a uh, Chicago piano, which is a multiple pom-pom. And it was firing at the, uh, at the parachute target. And someone had forgotten to lower the guardrail at the side of the ship. And a shell hit the top of the stanchion and shrapnel came flying past me. <laughs> and one piece lodged in my hand. And I had to uh, go down to the uh, sick bay to get it taken care of. Yeah, yeah. So that was my wound, <laughs> fired on by a, our own crew. <laughs> and and uh, what was the hospital like on a ship like that? Well, it was uh, it was small, mm -hmm. but uh, but well equipped. Mm -hmm. And there were two surgeons. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so I was well looked after. They had me had my hand bandaged up from the from my elbow right down my <laughs> wrist and everything else. <laughs> yeah, they were afraid, of course, of infection. You see, because it was so hot down there. Right. I see. Okay. So um, you mentioned your battle station. So you were mm -hmm. you worked in the books and the pay books. Yep. But you had a battle station as well. That's right. So, so how did this work then? Well, when when the um, when the alarm went and and uh, they called for action stations or battle stations, everybody dropped what they were doing and just ran for their uh, station. Oh, I see. Yeah. So everyone was allotted. A everyone had a had a spot. Right. So yeah. it didn't matter if you did books or not. No, it didn't matter. Right, okay. Cooks or anything else. Stewards. You know. Oh, really? Oh, okay. absolutely. So the cooks yeah. would have had theirs as well? Yeah. yeah. So, so really, from what I understand then, on a ship you had two jobs. Is that right? right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And so, for the, like, generally, when you're not in action or not at your battle station, mm -hmm. how, did, how would your day have kind of gone through? Well, we had a ship's office, of course. Okay. And uh, I'd report there in the morning, mm -hmm. and uh, we'd go through go through the day mm -hmm. and uh, stop for lunch mm -hmm. and whatnot, and uh, finish about 4 o'clock in the afternoon so, uh, on a normal day. So it's like a work day then. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. And what about social life while at sea? Well, there wasn't too much. There wasn't too much. Um, pretty well made, made your own. Some guys played uh, that were inveterate bridge players. And oh, yeah. Not, not, you know. Yeah. And, uh, but, uh, and sometimes the PA system, they'd pipe music or something like that through. They did have uh, films, mm -hmm. but uh, usually they were pretty old. And exchange them with some other ships to get get new ones. Oh, really? But um, with a crew that size, it was a difficult to, to have a space where you could get that many in. So right. you'd have to take turns with the crew. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, what about when you went through... Um, Asia, you said you, you went to Sri Lanka, you went yeah. to Hong Kong. Did you ever go on land in those places? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Any experiences about that? Um, no. One, uh, well, one thing maybe I should mention. Uh, my brother was in the uh, Royal Navy. He'd gone to England in 1935. Okay. And uh, when the war began, he uh, went in the Navy, and uh, we corresponded, and he knew that eventually that I was on the Ontario, mm -hmm. 
And when we were in Trincomalee, which, as I say, is on the east side of Ceylon, um, he apparently, who, he was skipper of a landing craft, and he was going ashore one day, and he saw this cruiser with the maple leaf mm. on the funnel. So he knew that Canada only had two cruisers, and uh, he found out then that this was the Ontario, so he, he sent me a signal uh, saying where he was, and I uh, visited him, and, and we had a meal together. On shore? No, on his ship. Oh, okay. So um, I didn't know he was there, and he didn't know I was there until this, right. this day. So. And had it been years yeah. since he'd seen each other? Or? It was years since I'd seen him. Really? So I'm one sitting with yeah. him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, wh what, when you said sent a signal, what, what is that? Well, he, his, uh, he, they'd send by, uh, uh, let's see now, he, it would be by light. Yes, I like. Yeah, okay. you know they had the, up on the bridge. They had these signal lamps. Mm, okay. Yeah. So like Morse code then? Exactly. Or? Oh, yeah. I see. Okay. Yeah, I see. When we were in the Mediterranean, we were doing evolutions to make sure the ship was in in fighting trim. Right. And uh, at one point, they shouted, "Abandon ship!" And all the crew jumped overboard, <laughs> which is kind of funny. It was warm. It was warm. That's nice. Yeah. And there were no sharks. So. <laughs> <laughs> and and would that happen often? Abandoned ship? Is that like a drill? It happened or? a couple of times. It was a drill. Yeah, yeah. And and did you know about it? Uh, usually, word got around, so you had time to. Take off your wristwatch or whatever you didn't want to get wet, mm -hmm. and uh, grab a life jacket and mm -hmm. jump over the side. Mm -hmm. so it was quite pleasant, I'd say. That'd be quite the jump, too, hey? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Fifty feet or how much? No, it wouldn't be that. Well, it it could be if you're on the way up on the upper deck, mm -hmm. but uh, no, it would be about. Uh, Sorry, go on. Just trying to think if there was any, anything else that. Uh, uh, Would you have like a fire drill or other sorts of? I mean, it's much yeah. different being an infantryman, for instance, on mm -hmm. land, and you're stuck in a boat, right? So, That's what right. sort of different training would you have? Exactly. It was, well, as you say, there were fire drills, there were different drills like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about, um, you know, Hong Kong? I, I think I remember, I recall you mentioning that you went on land in Hong Kong. Yes, we did. Yeah. What, was, what sort of things happened there? Well, the first thing we wanted was to uh, get some ice cream and, <laughs> and, 
they had they had good ice cream in Hong Kong, and we could get Sundays like, and we hadn't had any of that for for quite some time. Fresh fruit, you know, and All right, ice cream. Right. So uh, we uh, partook of that as often as we could. Um, Hong Kong, of course, was a uh, uh, Busy now, but it was busy then too. And uh, we, uh, I mentioned to you about uh, using cigarettes for for barter, mm -hmm. and uh, I picked up a couple of things ashore, and you could haggle with the shopkeepers as to how much you were going to pay. And right. so usually, if you if you uh, arrived at a figure. Money-wise, and, and he was still uh, reluctant to sell. You could say, "Well, uh, I've got a packet of cigarettes here. That's all it would take to oh, really, eh? complete the deal." <laughs> and, and and did you go? You you were on patrol there too, weren't you? Yeah. One, what, what one day, that? one day I was on patrol. We were. Um, uh, we put patrols ashore every day um, to uh, make sure there was no looting going on, uh, but mainly, I think, to uh, make sure that the fellows on leave weren't weren't uh, misbehaving, shall we say? Oh, really? Yeah. Eh? Yeah. What, what was it? Was it pretty? Chaotic there at the time, then. Uh, from time to time, it was. Yes. Right. Yeah, but they were pretty. They were getting it straightened out pretty well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, tell me a little bit about your commanding officers. What, what sort of relationship would you have had with them? Well, our captain was um, a chap named Grant from uh, Ottawa, and. Uh, he had uh, previously commanded um, a Royal Navy cruiser and had been decorated for action uh, in Europe. And very pleasant chap. He, uh, uh, I might mention one thing, I was quite chummy with the, uh, the chap who was the uh, Petty Officer Cook, who did nothing but cook for the commanding officer, Captain. Mm. And uh, I used to go down to, uh, to the uh, galley there that he had because uh, he made such excellent coffee. Oh, and I'd nice. go along there in the morning for a cup of coffee. And um, I was in there one day, and he... Uh, he said, would you like a piece of cake? And I said, yes, I would. And so he cut me a slice of cake. And I was sitting there with my coffee. And the uh, captain came in. So uh, I, of course, jumped to my feet. And he said, no, no, sit down, sit down. He said, And he, he wanted to tell uh, his uh, petty officer cook that he was having a couple of people for dinner the following night. So, uh, you know, he could have could have written me off for even being there, but right, but right. he just, uh, just, a, just a real pleasant guy. Right. And that would have been almost a coincidence. I mean, with yeah. that many people on board, would you ever see this guy? Very seldom. Right. Yeah. Right. He'd be up on the bridge, and of course, I didn't go up on the bridge. Right, so, of course. Uh, of course. Is there one memory or one experience that stands out for you a lot while you were at war? I think the only one that stands out, which was kind of uh, eerie at the time, was when I was uh, when we were on our way to Murmansk, and. Um, I felt the ship slowing down, and I went up on deck to see if I could see anything. I was surprised to see a destroyer 
was about a hundred yards off our uh, port side, and uh, they were rigging lines between the two ships, and eventually they shipped a guy in a, a stretcher from one ship from the destroyer to our vessel. And I found out that he was suffering from an appendix. And uh, they, figure our, uh, they figured our sick bay with our surgeon was uh, in a better position to operate on him than if they tried it on the destroyer. Mm. Which was fine, except that the next thing happened, we were dropping out of the convoy and uh, reducing speed to about four or five knots so that they had a stable platform on which to operate on this jet. Right. And so it took nearly four and a half hours, I guess, for the operation, at, in which time everybody was afraid to breathe and not, didn't want to make any noise for fear we'd attract attention. And uh, attract that, attention from? For submarines or, oh, or right. whatever. And uh, uh, you, could, you could hear the big sigh of relief when suddenly we resumed speed and right. made haste to get back to the convoy. Right. So know. that was kind of hairy. No kidding, no kidding. Um, so, where were you? Do you remember where you were on VE Day? It was in Belfast. You are in Belfast. Yeah. And they had all the shop windows boarded up mm -hmm. because they knew there was going to be a big celebration. <laughs> <laughs> and and what, sort of, what sort of feelings did you have on that day? Glad, I think, yeah. for one thing. And uh, I knew then that we'd probably be going to the Pacific because that was the next obvious thing, mm. and mm. which was fine with me. That was closer to home than, than where I was in Belfast. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and did you attend any VE Day celebrations? I don't recall doing mm. that. Mm. I think here again, I think we uh, they had a shot of rum for everybody that wanted it. Mm -hmm. This was a cel celebration. Right. Um, and then describe your feelings on VJ Day. Well, we were in the Indio Indian Ocean, I guess, at that time, when the word came that the Japanese had, had surrendered. And uh, here again, they spliced the main brace. We had an extra shot of rum. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we were we were glad that it was over. Right. Mm -hmm. and everybody was anxious to get home mm -hmm. at that time. I, I should should tell you when we were in Belfast, um, one one thing that uh, uh, puzzled me and, and made, made me a little angry. Uh, Mackenzie King and his government allowed the um, service people to vote as to whether they wanted to go to the Pacific Theater of War or not. And I didn't think that was right. I thought if you, if you signed up, then you should go where the, wherever you were sent. You shouldn't, you right. shouldn't have to uh, vote as to whether you wanted to go or not. Mm. But anyway, that's what we lost about a third of the ship's company Really? Who had elected not to go right. to the Pacific. Right. Yeah. Right. And would you have had, relate? like, would you have felt like a team of people? Well, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And right. suddenly you've lost a third of them, so you start all over training the, the uh, replacements. Right, right, right. Well, I didn't think it was right. <laughs> Doesn't matter. That annoyed me. It didn't matter, I guess. But right, right. And... Okay, well, tell me about when you found out you were going home and your journey home. When did you find out? I guess after we'd been in uh, Hong Kong. 
and it was decided then that we'd be going home. Mm. And uh, we knew we'd be going via Pearl Harbor, they told us that. Mm. So we thought, oh, and this is it, won't be long now, I can hardly wait. No kidding. Thing, you know. No kidding. Yeah. So even with all that warm weather and yeah, he still wanted to go he home. Still right? wanted to go home. You bet. And what was it like stepping foot on home soil? Well, that was something else. Uh, and we went into Esquimalt, and uh, first thing in the morning, and uh, I knew. Marion would be there mm -hmm. because we'd uh, we'd been allowed to notify our relatives. That we, and Marion at that time worked for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, and they sent a team over and to uh, interview the captain and that. And uh, she came with them, so that oh, was okay. that was nice for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And, and were were people lined up on the docks? Yeah, big crowd of people, band, a yeah, band there. <laughs> really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah, it was kind kind of emotional. I bet. Yeah, I bet. What What was emotional about it? I just just getting back there and, and being being part of this, being greeted by, uh, you know, the band and, and all the all mm -hmm. the people that were there. Mm -hmm. It was uh, it was something. You did, know. Did, did you feel honored? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, what about people? How how were they? What were their attitudes towards you after the war was done, and they knew you had been in the navy? I don't. Uh, I think some of them maybe were. Uh, I don't know how to describe it. I. Uh, of course, most of the, most of us were in the same boat. We'd seen service at, uh, in one of the services or, or the other, and uh, had had some experiences. So we, we were uh, sympathetic to one another. I'm mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know how else to describe it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, did. Did you have relationships with people who weren't in the Navy as well? Did oh, you? yes. Yeah. 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 And, and how, how do their experiences compare to yours? Like, I mean, actually, let me reword that. Um, you're in the Navy. What, what mm -hmm. sort of, I mean, from what I understand, that carries a certain amount of prestige, right? How did it feel well, being as, a naval as the person? senior service, it's called, yes. We, we, we <laughs> felt a little bit. Of prestige, yeah, yeah, and 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 so were you proud to be a a person who was in the navy then? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. You ever get seasick? No, I never did. <laughs> <laughs> Touch wood. <laughs> uh, what what kind of things were provided for you after you returned home? They had um, what they called uh, reestablishment credits, mm. and depending on the number of uh, Days you uh, or period of time that you were at sea, for instance, you got more. Uh, okay. And uh, I don't know. I forget what it amounted to because uh, uh, reestablishment credit. I, I know I used for uh, uh, house building. Build a house. That's what you did. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And um, do you think that you know veterans have been treated well upon returning home? I thought they had. For instance, the um, city. I bought a lot from the city of New Westminster for uh, forty percent of the assessed value. No kidding. That's what they did for the city. Did for yeah. us. Did other places do municipalities do that as well? I think or? maybe some did. I right. don't know. Right. Certainly, New Westminster did. Right. Well, it does have a rich sort of military yeah. heritage, right? Yeah. Uh, 
bought the lot in Victory Heights for 40% of the assessed value. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, and, and so tell me a little bit about the environment at home after the war. I mean, when you left, there was still the Depression, you know, things like that, you know, wartime. Now you're back home. What, what's it like? What's it like getting back into civilian life? Well, it was uh, it was uh, quite a change. Okay. Was it? Yeah. Uh, well, I I guess my you know in a way I had an unfortunate experience. Um, I worked for the city of New Westminster when I left. Okay. And uh, when I came back, uh, the personnel in the city hall had changed. And they didn't know me, and I didn't know them. And uh, so they really didn't know what to do with me. And they, um, so I went back anyway. And I went back at a salary of $200 a month, which was exactly that I'd been paid four years before when I left. Hmm. Well, that didn't sit very well with me. I figured it, there should have been at least some advance in, in that type of thing. Right. So uh, I, uh, after a couple of months, uh, I left and uh, got a job with a lumber company. Oh, okay. As, as an accountant? Yes. Oh, I see. And uh, ended up 30 years later as part owner of the, of the company. Oh, okay. So I did all right. I, I did. <laughs> right. Maybe they did me a favor. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, what uh, company was that? Brownsville Sawmills. Brownsville Sawmills. Yeah. On the other side of the river. Though. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you belong to any veterans organizations? Yes, belong to the Royal Canadian Legion mm -hmm. and also the Chief and Petty Officers Association. Okay. Yeah. And what sorts of things do these organizations provide you with? Well, as you probably know, the, the Legion uh, is uh, very strong in, in fighting for uh, uh, the rights of pensioners and whatnot, and, mm. and uh, uh, they do a lot of good work in that respect. Mm -hmm. the, um, the Chief and Petty Officers Association is based in uh, Victoria, or Esquimalt, mm -hmm. and uh, they, they're just, uh, well, they do charity work too, and they, they have, matter of fact, have a band, I think, that they, Oh, yeah. So, um, but it's more a fraternal type of thing. Right. Then. Right. Um, what, what does it mean to you to be a veteran? Well, I think I have to take a certain amount of pride in, in uh, knowing that I helped, mm. even in a small way, mm -hmm. to, uh, to help end the war. Right. And uh, I'm proud of that. Mm. And um, how, how do you and your family observe Remembrance Day then? I, I don't go down, but I watch everything on TV. Right. And contribute, of course, to the Legion through their poppy fund. Right, right. Yeah. Um, now, you were on the, the Ontario, and so you would have had relationships with many men. Do you still maintain contacts or friendships? from your service years? No, I don't, can't think of any one particular person. Mind you, uh, uh, a lot of them came from uh, Ontario. Okay. The, the crew. Right. And uh, quite a lot from the prairies, which is rather strange that mm -hmm. a prairie boy would go for the, but there were an awful lot of prairie mm. people ab aboard. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, what about other, like from outside the Navy? Then, do you maintain relationships with 
other servicemen? Um, not really, not that I can think of. No. 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 I used to have neighbors up uh, in the Victory Heights area that when we had parties, there were a couple of them there had mm -hmm. been in the Navy, but they passed away now as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, uh, okay. Um, okay, well, apart from that, I think we're done the interview. Is there anything you feel like I've um, missed or you'd like to add? No, you've covered it pretty well. There's <laughs> probably things I've forgotten. But <laughs> okay, anyway, that's uh, pretty well covers it. Okay. Well, well, thank you then, Mr. Lovett. You're very welcome.